Yeah, guys, I'm Elizabeth. Um, we're just going to actually start in a prayer because uh, really we're here for Jesus. And I'm just here to point you a little closer to him. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, we thank you for the pre your presence in the Eucharist. Jesus, I thank you that you are faithful and that you are always true. Jesus, I thank you that you meet us on the mountaintops and that you meet us in the valleys. Jesus, I thank you that you are the healer and the prince of peace. And Lord, I just ask that you use me tonight to speak your word, to speak your truth. Jesus, that as I speak, you would pierce hearts to deeper know you, to deeper pursue you, to deeper grab onto you, God, and not let go. Because you're worthy to be praised. So we just thank you and we worship you, Jesus. And we pray this all in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. So just to share a little bit, like Brian said, I, I lived in Colorado this past year and um, recently moved back. And in my time of, of moving back, it's been a lot of time of, of just simply prayer and time with the Lord. And so this message that I'm going to share tonight is very much from my heart and where I'm at right now with the Lord. It's very much a vulnerable place, and I really felt like the Lord was inviting me into sharing it. And the message is about waiting on the Lord. And so I just first want to start with um, talking about what it means to wait on the Lord. What the word actually means to wait, there's a lot of different definitions, but one of my favorite definitions is like when you're waiting for an ambush. That like when you've set up an ambush for someone and you're waiting for them to come or when you're hunting and you're like waiting for a deer to come, like you're anticipating, you're waiting for the thing to come. You're not passive, you're active. You're waiting on the presence. And um, a really amazing scripture that I found that involves waiting is the hemorrhaging woman. So I'm going to read from um, Mark, the story of the hemorrhaging woman, and I'm just going to sit with it for a second and allow you guys to take it into your hearts. And then I just want to speak on a few things that I've seen in it. There was a woman afflicted with hemorrhages for 12 years. She had suffered greatly at the hands of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet she was not helped, but only grew worse. She'd heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She said, if I but touch his clothes, I shall be cured. Immediately, her flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Jesus, aware at once that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and asked, who has touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see how the crowd is pressing up upon you, and yet you ask who touched me? And he looked around to see who has done it. The woman, realizing what had happened to her, approached him fear and trembling. She fell down before Jesus and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured. Thank you, Jesus. Now, a few things I want to uh, point out with that scripture is where this woman is coming from. This woman has been afflicted with hemorrhages for 12 years. She has spent everything she's had. And so we know that this woman is coming from a place of hope. Because if she didn't have hope, she really wouldn't be alive. She had spent everything. She had hope. She kept grabbing and grabbing and knowing that there had to be more. And this woman is coming from a place of vulnerability. You have to keep in mind that she left her home and for her to leave her home is so shameful that she was in a place where because she had hemorrhages, she was constantly bleeding and was not able to actually leave her home because she was considered unclean. So for her to fight through the crowd, to go through the people, meant that the shame that was upon her, that people would have recognized her and been like, that's the woman who's bleeding. She's unclean. If she touches me, I'm unclean. So the vulnerability that it took that she said, wow, he's worth it. I've heard of this Jesus. I've heard he's done miracles and I'm desperate to touch him. And she's coming from a place of faith. 
She says, but if I just touch him, if I just touch him, not if I talk to him, not if he prays with me for a long time, no, if I just simply grab on to him, then everything will change, then I will be healed. She's coming from a place of faith. And I just want to talk about that process that she waited and waited and waited, and she waited to be touched by God. And it's funny because in, in, in Psalms 27, it talks about waiting on the Lord. The, the last verse in the psalm says, wait for the Lord, take courage, be stout-hearted, and wait for the Lord. But a few verses prior, it says, one thing I ask, this I seek. Come, says my heart, seek his face. Multiple times in the verse, it talks about seeking, but it ends with waiting. And so it shows that in the waiting for God, in the waiting and the wrestling for him to answer us, that there has to be a seeking. That when we play, like a very simple example is when we play the game hide and seek. It starts with waiting. You start with counting. You're in a very passive place of counting, but then you have to go seeking. The game would never end. You would never find the person if you just simply sat there and just waited. You just counted. But there's actually this part of us that actually has to go seek and find the thing we're looking for while we are in the waiting. And one really, really beautiful example is in Song of Songs. In Song of Songs, the bride opens the door to find the bridegroom and he's gone. And instead of just waiting for him to come back, she goes and she looks and she asks the people, have you seen my bridegroom? And she, she says this really beautiful thing. She says, let me seek him whom my soul loves. And the bride searches for her beloved. And when she finally finds him, it says that she grabs on to him that she grabs onto him and, and doesn't want to let him go. And so let's talk a little bit more about the hemorrhaging woman when she finds Jesus. That she grabs onto him, but then she doesn't like, just leave. Like Jesus said, power has left me. He knew, he knew that he, she had grabbed onto him. And so he says, like, who has touched me? Who has touched me? And that was an, a moment where she could have fled in fear but she chose to come before him. And he says something so interesting. He says, daughter. And it's the only time in scripture that Jesus calls someone daughter, that he looks at her and he says, daughter. And you have to think about that she probably has been ostracized from her family. She probably hasn't had parents for a very long time because they consider her unclean. She's been waiting for so long to be a part of a family. And Jesus looks at her and he says, daughter. And there are so many things in the process of her finding God that should have stopped her. She was in the crowds with the people. And think about it, like there are thousands of people seeking Jesus, thousands. And she fought her way through the crowd to simply touch him. Now, there's so many times in our prayer and in the waiting where it's really easy to get distracted by the crowd. It's really easy to get distracted by the things in front of us that make it seem impossible to reach the thing that we've been waiting for, to reach Jesus. But really, we need to ask the question, is he worth fighting for? Do I truly believe in the depth of my being that he is worth fighting through the crowd, the distraction, the sin, whatever it is, whatever is keeping me from him, is he worth fighting through it? Because really what it boils down to is identity. When she found him, she found her identity because he named her daughter. When she found him, she found the truth, the way, the truth, and the light. And so when we are seeking, when we are waiting, are we seeking him who our soul loves? Are we seeking him who has spoken the truth over our life of who we are? And I just want to speak a little bit of my life, of how I've sought the Lord. There was a moment in time where I remember I had just recently met the Lord and I just wanted to go deeper. I just wanted to know him more and I felt like I was just waiting for him to come. I was like, Jesus, when am I going to get to know you deeper? And there was this opportunity where there was this conference like one day in a stadium happening in Orlando. And I had literally $90 in my bank account and my plane ticket was 85 
And I said, no, I just have to go for one day. I have to go for one day because I have to find the Lord. I have to seek him whom my soul loves. And I remember being in this stadium and I had my hands in the air and I was just worshiping Jesus. And I said, Jesus, do not let me leave the same, God. I don't want to leave here the same, Jesus. And I remember in that moment, it was like lightning hit my body and I fell to the ground weeping and I was out for two hours because I was encountering the love of the Lord. And in that time period, he spoke over me, you're going to go to the nations and share my name. And I remember after that moment, everything changed because I had encountered the beloved. I encountered the one who loved my soul. But the crazy thing is after that, I came home and I thought it was just this experience where I encountered the one my soul loved. But the reality is he invited me into that every single day. That we have this opportunity every day when we go in our prayer that says, Jesus, I won't leave until you touch me. Jesus, I won't leave your presence till I'm different. Do we enter our prayer asking him to change us? Do we enter our prayer knowing that he is the one who's created us so that he can make us new every day? Do we enter our prayer saying, Jesus, I don't want to leave until I love you more and I know more the love you have for me. Aren't we tired of, of mediocrity in our prayer? That the hemorrhaging woman didn't meet Jesus because she just saw him walking by and grabbed on. The hemorrhaging woman met Jesus because she went through the crowd to find him, to touch him, and she knew that she would never be the same. So this is an invitation that Jesus does not want mediocrity in our prayer. That he actually wants to encounter us new every single time, every single day, every single moment is a moment where I can grab on to Jesus or I can let him walk by. And every time he walks by, we see his back and you see, wow, this is a moment that I've missed encountering the Lord. Guys, there's been moments in my life where I was so focused on the people that were distracting me that I missed that Jesus had walked by. And those moments are not moments that I will get back. But there's an invitation to new moments with him. There's an invitation today to meet him in a deeper way. It's just a matter of if we choose to accept that invitation. And so looking back at the hemorrhaging woman, she left that day with a new identity. Do we leave every day knowing that we are beloved? That we are new? That we are precious? That we are all in all to him? And do we fight through the sins in our lives or do we tolerate them? Do we fight through the distractions that want to interrupt our prayer? Or do we tolerate them and say, oh, like my prayer time's done for the day? Because what I've seen with the Lord is when distractions hit, because they do hit, we push through and we continue saying, no, you're worthy, you're worthy, you're worthy. Jacob wrestled with the angel in scripture all night and he didn't, the angel didn't bless him till the morning which means all night he wrestled. And when the sun was coming up, the, uh, the angel struck, like, striked him in the hip and then gave him a new name, gave him a new identity, but he had to wrestle with God. He had to wrestle with the angel in order to know, him, to know the Lord more. And so what does it mean to be patient? Because so often when, when God's inviting us into something new, there's a patience that's required. But oftentimes when we hear the word patience, we think passive or we think I'm just going to like wait right here. But actually one of the definitions for patience is unyielding. And another definition of that's in James and another definition of patience is an intolerance for the work of the enemy. It's an intolerance for the things that are not of God. And so patience is very much active. That when we say we're patiently waiting on God, that's actually the battlefield. That's actually where we're wrestling and we're entering in and we're unyieldingly seeking his face. We're not willing to compromise our time with him. And when we allow ourselves to be lukewarm, we're actually agreeing with the enemy. And the, and the promises he's made over our life, because he's spoken stuff over our life as well. So when we say it's okay that, 
that I don't know God deeply. It's okay that I don't know his face. And it's actually saying like, I'm okay with the plans that the enemy has for my life. Are we saying we're okay with enemy's plans? Or are we saying, Jesus, like, I don't know what this looks like, but I want it. I want you. Because that's really what it's about. That's really what it is. It's it's showing up every day saying, Jesus, I don't know what this looks like. Maybe if it's you've been praying every day for the last 50 years, maybe you started praying every day like a week ago. It's every day showing up saying, I don't know what this looks like, but I know that I know that I know that I love you. And I know that I know that I know that every day you want to encounter me in a new way. And so I just want to leave us with a couple questions. I, I'm going to invite Hannah to just simply strumming. And I want us to take a little bit of time to simply ask the Lord these questions and to look over our own life and see where am I letting God pass by? Where am I letting him go before me and I'm not running after him to grab on? And I just want you to take time to look at him because he changes everything, guys. He radically changed my life and it's never been the same because I took time to simply look at him. I remember after I first met him, I would go to adoration for like 30 minutes every day, every day, and I didn't even know what to do. No one ever taught me. Like I just, I just like, I knew I encountered God and I knew like the prayers I could pray, but I didn't know what relationship looked like. And I remember sitting before him and simply saying, Jesus, I know that I love you. And I know that you talk to me and I know that I can hear you and I know that you hear me. So I'm simply gonna sit here and I'm gonna ask for more. And I'm gonna ask for more of you, teach me how to love you more. Cause really guys, it's grace. It's grace that we're able to love him more every day. It's not by our own will or by our own strength because that's striving. But it's grace that we're able to grab onto him. And so I want you to ask the question, am I desperate to encounter God? Am I desperate to encounter the creator of the universe, the one who made me, who knows the top of my head to the bottom of my feet, who knows every thought I've ever had. Am I desperate to know him? And then ask yourself the question, what are the things in the way that are keeping me from grabbing onto him? What are the things that I've tolerated in my life that have interrupted my prayer? that I've tolerated in my life that's even kept me from having my prayer. Because they might be good things. But if they're not him, then they're a distraction. And he needs to rightly order them. So Jesus, we just come before you. We come before you desperate for your touch, God. We come before you and we say, don't pass us by. We grab onto your garment, Jesus, and we ask you to change us, to not allow us to be the same, Jesus, but to radically heal our lives so that we can love you more. We thank you, Jesus, for your presence, and we thank you for your promises over our life that we are no longer servants, but we are children of the Most High King. And guys, I just want to invite you right now to surrender over the things that are distracting you from growing closer to God. I want you to look at him here on the altar and picture the things in your hands that have distracted you from going deeper with him. And I want you to say, here, Jesus, these belong to you. Because Jesus, I want to know you more. So I surrender these things at your feet. And just surrender them.